Now, since I filmed the rest of the section, two new methods have emerged from measuring distances and Hubble constant, two very promising methods, both of which involve using gravity to measure the expansion rate of the universe. The first method involves gravitational lenses, particularly gravitational lenses of quasars. So the idea is you have a distant quasar, which if you remember is a giant black hole in the middle of a galaxy, very bright, very small, and the light from that flies to the Earth, maybe 10 billion light years, and normally the quasar just looks like a single dot. But let's imagine that there is, say, halfway between the Earth and the quasar, a big heavy galaxy. The gravity of that galaxy can bend the light. So instead of just seeing the quasar as a single dot, you might see it as two dots, one because of the light bending over the top of the galaxy, one because of the light being bent around the bottom. Or in practice, you very often get more images, you might get the light bent around the sides as well. And here are four gravitationally lensed quasars. So for example, in the middle here is the galaxy, and this is four images of the background quasar. This is the galaxy, and there's two images and an arc. Sometimes you get an, almost a ring around the galaxy with bright spots or particular sparky bits in different places, but in all cases you get multiple images. Now, how does that help you measure Hubble constant? Well, quasars vary in brightness, probably due to some sort of instability in their accretion disk, but the brightness of a quasar is always varying, going up, down, up, down in some unpredictable pattern. So, if the quasar changes in brightness, say it gets twice as bright, light that's twice as bright will start moving on this long path to the Earth. But the light that goes over this top path here doesn't have as far to go as light that goes down the bottom path, because this one has been diverted further by going around the galaxy. So what this means is if there's any change in the brightness of the quasar, we'll see it first to the top image and then later with a time delay in the bottom image. And that's the fundamental principle for how we use these to measure the Hubble constant. What we do is we keep an eye on all the different multiple images and keep track of how they're changing with brightness. And they should all show pretty much the same pattern, but with delays. Whichever light path has travelled the furthest will be more delayed than the light path has travelled the least distance. And that's indeed what you see. You see these variations in brightness and you see delays. Now to get this you need lots of data. These images are only like an arc second across. You need really high quality, probably Hubble Space Telescope or adaptive optics or very good seeing imaging to pick them out, but you need to monitor them for months or years and look for the changes in brightness and measure the delay. And what that tells you is the difference in distance between the different routes. And that's actually a real distance. It's actually nothing to do with Hubble constant distance times anything. It's actually in light seconds, light minutes, light hours, physical distance you can convert to meters. Then you combine it with gravitational lens modelling. You can know roughly how far away the quasar is, how far away the galaxy is, you know the positions of the images, and therefore you can work out, depending on Hubble's constant, how big the time difference should be. You can compare it to how big the time difference actually is and use that to measure Hubble's constant. Huge amount of observation needed to do this, but it's been done and it's getting pretty accurate results comparable accuracy to many of the other much more established and traditional methods of measuring Hubble's constant. The second new method using gravity is gravitational waves. We talked about gravitational waves at some length in the violent universe part of the course. Basically what's happening is we have two compact objects, usually two black holes, which are getting closer and closer together and causing ripples in space-time, ripples in the metric that go out as they merge. And for the last five years, these have been picked up by the LIGO and Virgo gravity wave detectors here on Earth. And the data looks something like this. Again, for more details, see the Violet Universe course, where we go into this in great detail. What you see is just noise over here, then an oscillation. And the oscillation gets bigger and bigger, but faster and faster. And that's corresponding to the two black holes getting closer and closer together, spinning around each other faster 
Gravity waves are produced whenever masses accelerate. So as the black holes get closer, they're going to accelerate harder, so you can get stronger gravity waves, and because they're spinning around faster, because they're closer in, the frequency goes down, goes up. So what you see is a chirp pattern, you start off with a faint low frequency gravity wave, and then it becomes brighter and brighter and a higher and a higher frequency until they actually merge. Now, as we talked about in the Violent Universe course, you can learn a lot from this. But one of the things you can learn from this is Hubble's constant. Because what you can see from model fitting to this exact pattern is you can work out the mass of the two black holes. And if you know how massive the black holes are, then you can calculate, purely using the laws of physics, how much gravity wave energy they must radiate. So, you know how luminous they really are. You measure the flux of the gra gravity waves that you detect, and therefore use the inverse square law to work out the distance. It's, at the moment, not very precise. It gives Hubble constants comparable to other methods, but with very large error bars. But this method will get a lot better in the next decade or so, when we have more powerful gravity wave telescopes to get better quality data, and may well end up being the most accurate method of them all, you know, 10 or 15 years from now. So how do these two methods fit in? Well, their great benefit is that they're quite independent of the other methods. They're very direct. Most methods of getting distances rely on a distance ladder where you start off with c field variables and then work out the distance of the Magellanic Cloud, calibrate supernovae. None of that's relevant to either of these methods, either the gravitational lenses or the gravity waves. They just rely on gravitational physics and you go straight from your observations to a Hubble's constant. So, they're very direct, there are fewer things to go wrong, and they're quite independent of all the other methods. If, for example, we don't understand Cepheid variables, or we don't understand dust or something, it doesn't really matter for these methods. These methods might have their own problems, but they're quite different problems from everything else. So it's very exciting that we now have new methods to work out the Hubble constant.